DB here, hey Stings. Crackle the hint, calm. Group chat, my room, 10 minutes, okay? The static click showed that CB didn't care if it was okay or not. These things have been summoned. You've got five minutes or so. so. Let me tell you what goes on here. This is the Binky Bear Toy Company, and owned by Cecil Binkentop, which is as good as a, a reason as any to call yourself CB. The Binky Bear symbol is famous everywhere because of the first cuddly toys and dolls ever made. Nowadays, they have become popular for model cars, coaches and lorries in miniature. And coping with demands for so many types of toys brings constant headache for the work manager. Perhaps you didn't know, but that title belongs to Ted Hastings, Harry's dad. The Lodge Bear sighed pushed his glasses back on his nose and gave up trying to make sense of the computer sheets, detailing sales, production targets, materials delivered, the 230 horse race at Kempot, the 230 what? He must have all with help. Someone was practicing to be a tough accountant. So what was up with CB this time? Perhaps he wanted to moan about the last batch of dogs, the ground and staying instead of saying mama when you squeezed them. The trouble was the new batch hadn't fared much better. Oh the noises were all right this time but they looked silly with alloy reels instead of eyes. Not that the Aston Ferguson sports scars looked too hot running around on four doll's eyes. This is what you get when you keep swapping toys on production lines. But CB wouldn't listen. More sales and more sales was all he wanted. Ted was trying to think up belief some believable excuses when his knock on CB's door was answered by loud enter. Uh, morning, CB. You were going to query the dolls' growers on the eyes of the spot. There was something about CB's office with. Huge desk and executive toys and a notice on it with the words the buck stops your side that tongue tied Ted every time. CB stared at him for a moment and said I wonder if the job's getting too much for you at your age, Ted Wynn. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to see you about the catering. Now who'd flipped? But CB, I'm your worst manager. I mean, I know what you mean. But I'm talking about catering for a party. I'm arranging one for my two darling daughters, Hermione and Fenella. It was explained with obvious pride that this was not to be a common birthday party, but a send-off to, as both girls were going to the Royal Favoured Public School Rowell. CB continued. Now, I understand you have some family connection with that remarkable food emporium, fortress and mansions in the city. Uh, this was true. And Maud was the connection. She was his mother's twin sister. This was where the resemblance ended. She had gone to the Orient in the good old days as a governess but never married. How well, she became wild wealthy and a shareholder in several companies was a question no one asked. Her money was also allowed her money also allowed her to travel back home when she felt like it and impose upon any member of the family she who didn't feel like it. Yes, Phoebe, that would be Miss Barnley Common. She's a major shareholder. Phoebe chortled. <laughs> and I expect if she was backward as a child, she would have been commonly bottom of her class. What? 
Ed politely laughed. Jokes wear on him. Oh, we're so thin after constant use. The longest short of it was that CB wanted to save money on the deal. He was going to impress his friends because the caterers would have the FNM name and would cost cash and carry prices. So, continued CB, if she could arrange to for her firm to be at my humble abode on the 23rd, I'd be most grateful. Of course, there must be a personal invitation, said to Miss Birmingly Cotton, I mean, Miss Cannonly, er, uh, Aunt Maud, Ed suggested. Precisely. See to it, will you, Hastings, and I suppose you'd better be there, but I'm not having those two monsters you call daughters, not after what happened at the last party. Now, Ted was only too aware of the problems caused by the twins and had even toyed with the idea of putting them into the circus and lion tamers. It wouldn't be a pretty sight though to see grown lions cry. No, it was one thing for him to say rude things about his daughters. But he wouldn't have anyone else offer criticism. That's a bit unfair, CB. It was just harmless fun. They were getting their own back. Your girls had put cameras in the twins' satchels, and when they got home, the furry things are eating most of the new exam papers they had stolen in order to sell and make some pocket money. CB rubbed the desk. And how did they retaliate? retaliate? Well, all right, I'll remind you, the lime jelly they kindly donated was made with green washing up liquid. They poured hot chili sauce in the goldfish pond. I spent the afternoon rushing around throwing goldfish back in the pond. They kept leaping out on the grass to cool off. They started a custard pie fight and then, then kidnapped the hamster and held it to Ramston ransom for 50. My girls were gibbering wrecks. Ted was lost for a rational argument and just protested that they were a year older and so much better behaved. Anyway, if he, Ted, and wife Dolly were going to attend, it might prove difficult to find babysitters in time. Anyway, it would be impossible. No one would have them to stay. Insurance companies had added exclusion clauses into all policies Explaining any liability should the household allow I, Holly and Ivory to even knock on the door. CB looked as though he would explode with the internal battle going on. Did he want posh caterers more than he wanted the twins? He succumbed. Dire threats as to Ted's continued employment should the twins do anything else but breathe while they were at their party. Ted was repeating these warnings at the dinner table that evening whilst Dolly was throwing up her paws in horror at such tales. She wouldn't have it. How could these angelic babies of her ever do those things? Give up for Ted for the sake of peace and quiet. Give up. Then his face clouded and he tapped his jacket pocket. Oh, bother. It was only torment as he drew out a letter and envelope. This was a request for Aunt Maud's help, as DB had instructed. But not being sure of her person address, Ted brought it home. He had even forgotten to get a stamp for it. Yes, Dolly knew where she was. She was with her sister, Grandma Hastings, in Maidenwood, a most select part of the city. And that's the address that Ted wrote. Oh, Daddy, beamed Holly, if you give us some money to get stamps from this dispenser, and Ivy continued, we'll be ever so pleased to post it for you. Before Ted had a chance to listen to the alarms that were about to ring inside his head, 
Dolly expressed herself delighted to hear her wonderful twins being so helpful. One took the stamp bunny and one took the lair. They both kissed Mum and promised to be careful crossing the road. Assuring himself that they were for reforming did not remove the feeling of, of lead weight would settled in Ted's stomach. It certainly wasn't Dolly's cooking. She was a wonderful cook. He knew why it was. The ball of doom had begun to roll his way. The twins were very careful crossing the road, just as they were told. But it wasn't across the road that the post box dispenser stood. Across this road stood a telephone box, and inside it they opened the letter to Aunt Maud. By this box, they sniggered and dropped the stamp money through the telephone's pay slot. Hello? Is that Uncle Jack? The 23rd was a sunny day, as should all days be when there's a garden party in progress. Judging by the number, size, and absurdity of the hats being worn, it was more like Ladies' Day at Kemcock. There would have been no surprise if royalty had appeared in the middle of the throng. TV had spared no expense on the numbers invited or the marquees provided in which to entertain everybody. It was a noted success and the champagne flowed like water. Well, it wasn't quite a success. You see, there were no catering staff on duty yet, and CB and his family were running everywhere, pouring out the bubbly and offering the crisps. There wasn't anything else to offer. The Hastings arrived. Dolly looked radiant, Ed uncomfortable, Harry untidy, Neville smooth, and the twins impeccable. CB greeted the him with less charm than even Ted was expecting. Hey, Stings! His aspiring host bellowed, then came close enough to whisper through gritted teeth. Where the blazes is your aunt and her armory of caterers? We're nearly on our knees trying to serve drinks, and people are starting to make strange comments. If you mess Ed hurtfully insisted that a letter giving time and details had been dispatched the day CB had asked. True, it was now three o'clock and the letter had stayed no later than midday. Perhaps he could use a telephone in the house to check what had happened. CB wanted to say it was the twins who, who were to blame, but Dolly was looking at him with narrowed eyes. The lead weight in Ted's stomach was now accompanied by invisible lumps of concrete dragging at his feet as he returned with the news. The caterers could not face any orders for today, and Aunt Maud had accused him of being drunk if he was suggesting that he would ever organise anything for a total stranger like C.B. There was a pause. The ball of doom had arrived. You are fired, Hastings. Do you hear? You're fired. No, that wasn't the ball of doom. CB didn't actually see it rolling through the gates of his home. Its shape wasn't wasn't round, more van-like, and it was. Gaily and coloured in red and white stripes. Out behind was a box trailer, likewise adorned with flags flying and a large banner proclaiming the King of Catering. Yes, it was badly spelt. Not my fault. It's because CB was staring at Ted, perhaps trying to will him to turn into something he could tread on. CB did see or hear the van drive up right behind him. 
Of course, now the van was only three inches away from him. He did hear the noise of its horn as it suddenly bled. He jumped. Well, when you, the Christian held, fell over the ground and he shook the bottle of bubbly so violently the cork didn't need pulling out. It flew out. It flew through the air as fast as a bullet and caught Seymour or drew it me just below the hairline. Much to everyone's surprise, the hairline moved right off his head along with the cork bullet. It was a wig. The stone gasp with echo drew in Mead's cry, soon turned to gales of laughter. The guests fell about, some writhing on the floor in helpless mirth. The party had cheered up this side of the garden, hadn't cheered up on the other side. It looked like he wished he could turn into something to tread on. Dolly looked anxious, although she put a brave smile on her face. Harry and Neville looked confused, and the twins didn't look anything. They had disappeared again. But the driver of the van and was the very man that neither I nor any member of the family had talked to you about, except that he was a stocky. It was Uncle Jack, Jolly's early eldest brother. He wasn't ashamed of him. He was a good hearted fellow, but with a voice so loud as his stomach was large. Ted Hastings' family had learned to love Dolly, although they had hoped he would have married someone nearer their own status. But her family was different. Her mum and dad ran a pub, the Wellington's Retreat, in South Norwich, in the east of the city. They were cockneys and proud of it, and told everyone that they were proud of it. Jack was proud of the most, and in spite of a naughty past, had pulled himself up to his present important position, the position of Pearly King. His dark suit and cap were embroidered with thousands of sequins to bespit his cockney royal title, which made his fiery and very red face glow even more. This was Jack Nelson Trout. Who's the governor? He boomed. Dolly Pot pointed nervously at the thunderous, thunderstruck figure of CB. Jack clapped a huge paw on CB's shoulder. Sorry, we sorry we're late, boss. I did a job finding the old place. I tell you, I'm green tracking already. Jack Trout at your service, and in the van, my trouble and my strife, Agnes. That's Agnes to you and me. So I'll get cracking away, mate. I'll get cracking away, mate. Oh, and by the way, you can have a sample of the house oh, speciality on me. The galley slapped a plastic tub into CB's yielding paw and drove it in the middle of the garden and set up shop with much loud noise. The contents of the tub appeared to be just a greenish jelly, but closer inspection showed within a lump of fishy meat. Phoebe stared without knowing why it was. Can I, can I eat this? he asked. Only if you're partial to a bit of jellied eel, Ted replied with a nurse. Phoebe <laughs> gave a yelp and the piece of eel and the jelly plopped onto the grass. Seemed to take ages for the words to come out of CB's moving mouth. You, you have ordered that vendor of jelly deals to, to, I'm ruined, you're fired. You, you can't fire me twice, CB. I'll reinstate you so I can, so I can. I've never been so didn't finish because Major Ursa retired. The MP for Whitson Bay 
interrupted him. I say, old chap, how simply splendid of you to arrange such wonderful catering. We were all worried that you were going to lay on boring old smoked salmon and caviar. But instead, this wonderful, not only are the jelly eels and cups of roti I mean, sorry, he out of this world, but he can play the spoons like a native look. Sure enough, every guest was by the stall, many of them dancing in ease up while Agnes sang and Jack rattled the spoons. People were laughing, cheering, gulping down jelly deals and gallons of strong sweet tea. Phoebe stubbornly continued, I've never been so pleased with one of my ideas. It's a good thing you carried out my instructions so carefully, Hastings. This could mean a raise for you, my man. He walked off, more skipped off, arm in arm with Major Ursa. Now Ted was thunderstruck. And then Dolly gave him a big kiss and told him, well done. Ted and his family started to walk down to join the throng. Dolly asked him, did you know that our wonderful daughters organised this? No, but I guess, smiled Ted. They were so worried that they had done wrong. Shall I tell CB who really fought it all up? No, my dear, I shouldn't. He might not know whether to shake them by the hand or by the throat. <laughs> Thank you.